Welcome everyone to uh, the first webinar in our Diverse Europe series in the Amsterdam Center for European Studies. Um, I'm very uh, excited that all of this has come together today under the inspiring uh, guidance of my colleague Jamal Shaheen. Um, he will be moderating this session and chairing this session, so I'll just take a few words to introduce him to you. Uh, before I do so, I would also like to draw your attention to the, uh, uh, the next installment of this series, which is going to take place on April 6. It is our intention to have our webinars always on the first Tuesday of the month, with the exception of today, obviously. And um, the next session will be entitled Embracing Diversity in Europe Today and more about that soon when it will be announced also on the website of ACES. A uh, few words about my colleague Jamal. Uh, Jamal is a colleague from the Department of European Studies, uh, and at the same time, he is also a research professor at the Institute for European Studies at the Freie Universiteit, the Free University in Brussels. And he holds a PhD in politics from the University of Hull, and Jamal, you are and have been working on global internet governance, on political participation in the European Union, on EU governance, and also on the impact of the internet on policy making. And I think all of this, as well as you know, we all you know is a very inspiring lecturer, will certainly make you the perfect host for today. So the floor is yours and uh, go ahead. Thanks, uh, Hido, <clears throat> and um, welcome to everybody. Uh, I suppose we should say the typical Zoom thing, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I'll save the good night till later. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks for being here and thanks for the introduction, which is uh, uh, completely unexpected um, because uh, it's actually thanks to you and Divya that uh, this event is moving forward. Um, and um, so, yes, uh, thank you very much to Divya and yourself for uh, organizing the whole series and, and, and starting the ball rolling with this event, which does look to be a very interesting one. Um, we're looking at responses to what we've called pandemic democracy. Um, it's a catchy phrase that uh, maybe inspires a discussion that we're hoping to have over the next hour and 20 minutes or so. Um, looking into yeah, the, the ways in which uh, this pandemic has changed the way we think about democracy um, in one way or another. Um, this is, as Gijido said, this is the first of the Diverse Europe um, webinar series, which is part of the um, Amsterdam Centre for European Studies. Um, and we're very lucky to have uh, three speakers, I was going to say four. <laughs> <laughs> I can count. Very lucky to have three speakers with us today um, who are going to hopefully um, have, well, lead a discussion uh, on this topic, bringing in their various uh, research expertise um, and linking up to some of these bigger questions that we're going through, thinking about how democracy is changing and how the pandemic may be exacerbating that situation or not. All three speakers um, come from slightly different perspectives and bring slightly different dimensions to the debate. Um, we're going to, um, I'll, I'll introduce them in a second, but first of all, I'll tell you a bit the way we're going to, to um, operate. Uh, we're going to have basically three kind of sets of questions that we're going to look through. Um, and launch a bit of a discussion amongst all of the speakers around each of these three questions. You can see Andy. Oh no, you found the questions. That's good. <laughs> no. uh, so we're going to go through with three rounds, if you like, um, uh, looking at three different aspects of this topic um, and hopefully bringing up some um, points that will interact amongst the speakers, but also amongst the audience. So feel free. Um, as members of the audience, as Guido said, to um, um, uh, type questions into the Q&A um, so that we can actually um, further the discussion um, <clears throat> with you as well. There'll be a moment at the end of the session as well where we can have uh, Q&A, but I would invite you um, 
very kindly to um, uh, pose your questions as they come up and then we might be able to get through them in each of these three different rounds. So um, I'll introduce the three speakers to you um, who are, um, well, who are from different parts of the world right now. Um, we have, first of all, Stefania Milan, who is an associate professor in new media at the University of Amsterdam. Um, she is the co-founder of the Big Data from the South Research Initiative, investigating the impact of datafication and surveillance on communities at the margins. And um, the last time we met, Stefania had a beautiful background that was uh, um, showing off the, the latest book that she's just written, COVID-19 from the margins. I imagine that we'll have part of our discussions about that. But I also know that Stefania has been working on a project looking at micro-targeting in elections. Um, um, and so we're going to hear a bit about that as well, I imagine. Then we have Eva Hun Reimann. Um, who has won a, a dissertation prize in 2019 for this. I'm going to show this off because I've read it. <laughs> this splendid um, piece of work. Um, but the prize was given by, um, I, I'm going to find this very difficult to read, but since Latin is a dead language, I don't think anybody minds. Premium Erasmanium, did they do well? The, the Premium Erasmanium Foundation for her thesis, which was entitled Deliber Deliberative Political Campaigns, Democracy, Autonom or Autonomy and Persuasion. So we're going to hear about Ava's work. She's currently working in the philosophy department at the UVA, um, and she's the chair of the Universitätsforum. So um, welcome to you as well, Ava. And then finally, we have Andy Reynolds, um, who is a research scholar at the School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University, who has a PhD from the University of California, San Diego. And his research and teaching focuses on democratization, constitutional design, and electoral politics. Andy is the author of, or and co-author of, a number of books. I won't read out all the titles, but, uh, but they've all come out in the last, uh, well, uh, there's been quite a few in the last in the last few years. Um, the last one being Children of Harvey Milk, How LGBT, to LGBTQ Politicians Changed the World. So, um, Andy, I will also mention, I think Andy will be a visiting fellow at ACES and the, the Diverse Europe Centre from December onwards, COVID pending, right? So we look forward to welcoming you then uh, to Amsterdam. So, so as I said, we're going to have a discussion now around three, well, basically three groups of questions. Um, this discussion is centered around the main theme of the webinar, which is about um, how, um, how democracy and democratic institutions have actually evolved um, in light of the pandemic or in light of the corona crisis. Um, and I guess the first kind of question for discussion that I'd like to raise um, would be would, would be asking all of you, and we haven't decided on an order yet, so uh, I'll just look who's ever willing to speak first. But the first question would be around this question of democratic practices and how they're changing in light of the pandemic. Um, is this something that is specific to the pandemic or do you think the transformation in, in democracy is something that we've been witnessing over time? Um, do you think that these questions are actually being, or these, these challenges to democracy are actually being exacerbated by the pandemic? Or do you think that um, this is something very pandemic specific? There you go, that's the first Round of questions. Um, who's going to look at the screen first? Stefania. <laughs> I did try to look down, but uh, <laughs> not serious about that. No. So thank you uh, very much to the organizer. Ah, 
That always happens, doesn't it? Advisors and to, to ask us for hosting, uh, uh, from my co-speakers here, and of course also from why we say yes to these things. But so I'm gonna try to answer your question, looking at the sort of higher order of things. I come from the Department of Media Studies, so I'm here wearing my disciplinary hat, if you want, and sharing my obsession for uh, data, everything data. So data, data production, quantification, but also, of course, uh, the role of data infrastructures and uh, what we have seen uh, happening during the pandemic, which is an increase, if you want, of governance by uh, data infrastructure, for example, by health data infrastructure, given the nature of the crisis that we're living through. So as I wrote uh, earlier in the, in the first months of the pandemic, together with a colleague from um, the University of Italia in Switzerland, uh, Philippe Di Salvo, this is the first pandemic and probably the last, but you never know, right, of uh, the data fight society. What do we want to say by that? So essentially, um, the data fight society, so the fact that our society relies in increasingly for its functioning on data production and data analysis on the very grand scale uh, means that, um, well, the pandemic has accelerated the process that was already there and it has made it more uh, visible, centering the role of data in uh, you know, making sense of the crisis itself, but also the role of data, data infrastructure in trying to locate viable answers, including justifications for, for example, draconian measures like lockdowns of, uh, or core few. So my, my way of answering to your question, Jamal, is very, very, very broad. And as I said, a sort of more systemic level. I have, uh, as we are gonna you know, probably elucidate or discuss later, this systemic uh, level that in a way it's, you know, it's all the gray area above us or the mechanisms that are a bit difficult to grasp or from the individual perspective, they nonetheless affect each and every uh, individual that is, uh, you know, living in this case in, uh, you know, a liberal uh, democracy. Now, of course, it affects even worse people who are not living in a democratic system. But I guess I'll leave it at that. I hope the, uh, this uh, list uh, makes the, uh, the story complex, if not answer uh, your question. Thanks, Stefania. It brings in this dimension of data, which, um, <clears throat> which I think is, is um, what well, is vital to the way we understand how democratic practices are actually changing, right? And how this data is actually being used by different political parties or political actors um, to actually bring people or bring different voices to the fore and so on. Um, who wants to go next? Eva, you're looking? Yes, that's good, thanks. Yes, thank you. Well, there is, of course, there, I think, uh, so many things that we might talk about or, uh, or, or perhaps also speculate about. I think for me, um, as you mentioned, uh, I uh, worked a lot on deliberative theory. And I think from the perspective of deliberation, um, it, it, I think, is uh, interesting to look at what um, this pandemic and having elections during the pandemic and uh, public discourse during a pandemic has done to sort of the nature of public discourse. And um, I mean, these are just sort of first observations. I, th I think we're all still very much in it. So I'm sure we'll learn a lot more, uh, perhaps once we can also take some distance from it, uh, hopefully uh, soon. But um, uh, yeah, but I think one thing that is important uh, in the idea of deliberative democracy and having a public discourse that guides um, uh, political decisions is the idea that we um, deliberate with each other on the basis of uh, values, that values are central to, uh, to politics. Um, and I think um, looking at what uh, sort of living in a, you might say, pandemic democracy has been like over the past year, um, I think you can see sort of two, you might say, contradictory moves. On the one hand, there is this tendency, which I think Stefania also already alluded to, towards a form of technocracy, you might say, where um, uh, it's about uh, problem solving, indeed datafied, guided by uh, expertise. Um, and this is um, uh, imp impoverishing, I think, is that the word? Uh, at least, uh, yeah, impoverishing uh, public debate in that sense. There are a lot of things that we don't, at least explicitly, 
uh, discuss about uh, sort of the underlying uh, values that guide decision making, for instance. So that's, I think, one thing we may observe. On the other hand, um, I find it also interesting that um, uh, that just the fact that this pandemic has challenged our whole society and has um, has stopped so many things that we taken for granted that this seems to have um, have given us a new understanding of uh, all the things that we've taken for granted for so long and 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 that we value them and perhaps also why and I think this is something that we don't currently yet really um, uh, profit from in the sense that we're still very much in it and we're still very much part of sort of the more technocratic debates but I'm hopeful that this um, uh, uh, but I don't want to make any pr uh, predictions about the future. That's not my uh, my my expertise. But I'm still I'm hopeful that uh, you know the, the value of human interaction, of work, of public services, um, um, uh, healthcare, education, solidarity, these things, for instance, that they might uh, invigorate and and enrich uh, public discourse. Uh, in the future, um, uh, in a way, you could say you could say that the idea of the the dead dogma that was introduced by John Stuart Mill and still is a useful notion. I think you could say that a lot of dead dogmas have been sort of reinvigorated, perhaps um, because of this experience. So that might be um, uh, good for democracy in the in the longer run. Thanks, Eva. So drawing then on this question of values and how we. How we consider values that's um, <clears throat> also becoming yeah very important andy do you want to do, do you have uh, yeah absolutely no thank you and first let me uh thank the the organizers for the invitation today and, and my panelists um i'm i'm from uh calling you from princeton new jersey in the united states i should warn you that um a tree is actually being cut down next to my house and at various times it's literally being fed into a wood chopper so I have the scene from Fargo, the movie, if anybody remembers that next to my window. So um, do not be alarmed if you hear the wood chopping of a large tree. Thank you, um, Andy. That's not distracting at all. Then. No, not distracting at all. Um, I always like to distract from my comments just to, to make sure I don't, you know, I'm not the, uh, the main game. Um, I should also say that, you know, I'm really interested in democratization and um, political change. I have a very limited um, expertise in the politics of the Netherlands. So please excuse me for that. Um, I think maybe um, my three uh, sort of uh, credits uh, um, reasons for talking on the Netherlands is one, I, I really enjoy coming to the Netherlands. I, I like Amsterdam a lot, and I'm greatly looking forward to my visit. Um, secondly, um, when Ruud Hullet was playing for Chelsea, I thought he was a terrific player. I really thought Hullet was fabulous. And thirdly, perhaps more importantly, um, I was trained, my PhD supervisor was a, a political scientist called Aaron Leipart, who is quite a famous Dutch political scientist. So I am the son, the son of Leipart. So that is my, um, that is my uh, credibility, if, if there is any, for thinking about the Netherlands. Um, in the question that um, Jamal has posed us about democratization and elections as they come up, I mean, I, I would start by making a couple of points that spring to my mind. Firstly, um, the pandemic um, has obviously uh, put a number of hurdles in the way of um, progress in democracy. Um, and we don't really know how big those hurdles are until we can assess and evaluate the legacy of what's happened. But I think that we need to be cognizant of the fact that in many countries, political diversity, representative diversity, the, the space for marginalized communities and other non-traditional political voices has become bigger. So, so we are seeing whether along the lines of gender or sexual orientation, um, whether on, along the lines of, of um, uh, class, um, more and more voices from people who weren't necessarily at the table before having a bigger role in politics. Um, and I think that one of the driving forces that has changed 
social values, but legislation as well, is this age old theory of contact, of, of relationships, of interactions. Um, so when you have the other at the table, elected or appointed or otherwise, you begin to get different types of conversations and discussions. And Ava obviously focuses on this on deliberative democracy. So my question would be, to what extent do elections during a pandemic, do um, elections that are constrained by all these social constraints, change the dynamics of interactions? I mean, practically, we're seeing elections that are moving online almost entirely. Now, certainly the trend was there before. Certainly, um, the pandemic is exacerbating, as Jamal said, a previously existing trend of moving campaigning, discussions, deliberation online. Um, I remember going back where, to help my friend in the 2019 election in the United Kingdom in, in mid Derbyshire um, and spending a month there and just being stunned by the lack of posters in windows the lack of um, meetings on the ground. Um, this was before the pandemic, just before, but still most of the campaigning had moved online, even in a rural area. It wasn't the fates and the church meetings and the meetings in the public square in the same way as it had been before. We weren't looking at houses and saying how many orange posters, how many blue posters, how many green posters, red posters are there. It was a very different type of feel. And I, I wonder, and we'll discuss this in much more detail, but I wonder to what extent the pandemic and electioneering in the pandemic exacerbates the difference between the haves and the have nots. Do we have a situation where the people with resources do better and the people without resources do worse? If you move the act of politics into a virtual space, do you advantage anybody? I mean, in theory, you could advantage the have nots, but I'm not sure there's any reason to believe that. So the question, I think, not just for majorities and minorities, but also for the way politics is done, is that who wins and who loses from this new game, this new setup? So I'll start with those ideas. That's great. Thanks, Andy. That's <clears throat> uh, Stefania or Ava, do you want to respond to Andy's challenge there? Who's winning? <laughs> I want to thank you, Andrew, for your optimism about uh, that. Sorry, there's there's my there's a, there's my screen is making sounds. I hope you can uh, hear them. Uh, no, I want to thank you, Andrew, for the the optimistic message. I mean, you you ended with a critical set of questions, but um, you also draw our attention to the fact that increase that in fact the um, diversity has increased in the public sphere. If I may summarize it. I, I like that idea, although I do believe that we still are, um, you know, behind in terms of, uh, you know, the amount of voices and again, the diversity. And also I do believe that it is a very often more like a cosmetic, um, you know, uh, result rather than an actually something that includes uh, communities uh, for real. And in fact, we have seen that uh, at play also with uh, the pandemic, but I guess we are gonna talk about that uh, later. So I'm, I'm grateful for the sign of optimism. I'm not sure I entirely agree. Yeah, well, I do. Um, uh, I do think that when it comes to sort of moving uh, campaigning online, which indeed is another, I think, I mean, I agree with you there that, that that's another um, important uh, sort of development that was already going on and uh, that certainly strongly um, sort of exacerbated by the pandemic. I think to return to Jamal's first uh, phrasing of the question, um, Parts of that effect might might be temporary. I think there will be some some return. I expect to some um, some forms, at least, of physical campaigning. There are certain things that 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 are simply still easier to do um, uh, physically and, and, and face to face. Um, but uh, but I agree with you there that that's an important development. And it, again, from a deliberative point of view, I think also relevant because um, I. I do believe it's true that um, generally speaking, there are certain things, certain types of conversations that are just um, best to have 
uh, in, a, in, a, in a real life setting. And particularly, and I think Stefani already alluded to this, uh, given the fact that online uh, forums um, uh, are not necessarily shaped in such a way that they benefit democracy best. Uh, um, so, uh, I mean, democratic principles have not sort of been the first uh, basis for sort of the shape of, for instance, uh, social media. And when it comes to, I think, uh, the 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 haves versus the, the have-nots, however you want to make that distinction, right? I mean, there are many ways in which you can make that distinction, but um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I agree with you that um, uh, that indeed this 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 uh, pandemic might sort of strengthen those those differences. I don't believe we should be um, necessarily as concerned, and some people are about it, sort of the what some people call the fragmentation or the diversification online. Uh, I do think that sort of the on, the online possibilities that you mentioned, Andy, for sort of a greater diversity of voices and minority, um, um, perhaps niche um, uh, forums and interactions uh, can also really be invigorating, democratically speaking. Um, but then we do need some form, some public forms, right, in which we can all sort of bring them together and reflect on everything that's uh, uh, that happens within these uh, these smaller communities. So those are just a few small points, I guess, in response to uh, to to the points that Andy made. Thanks. Um, maybe just building on that a bit, Eva. I mean, <clears throat> what uh, what I've been struck with is that you know we see an increased diversity. We see this you know larger numbers of of of, of groups uh, being created, but. Um, are they actually talking to each other? And do we? How do we reinforce these public spaces that you're talking about, or these public fora that allow for this interaction between these groups? Because what I, what you know, just looking at the pandemic, you have the 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 COVIDians, I think they're called, and you know the people who take the scientific approach, or as you called it, you know, focused really much more on the technocratic kind of angle. And and I'm wondering, you know, is it not actually pushing these these groups as, apart from each other rather than interacting or encouraging this space for interaction i don't know yeah i think if if the question that you ask is an empirical one then of course i'm i'm a philosopher i'm not yeah. in that sense <laughs> cannot really speak to that directly i mean from what i understand there are um, let's say signs in in both directions um, but perhaps stefania could say more about this um, but the, uh, in, in the sense that um, uh, on the one hand, uh, the, uh, there do seem to be uh, signs that indeed, um, uh, well, you know, the, the, the whole discussion that we know, that we all know about, of course, about uh, filter bubbles, uh, the, um, selective information, that sort of thing, that that indeed sort of reinforces our tendency to only speak to those who agree with us and, and also reinforces sort of the strength with which we believe the things that we believe. Uh, on the other hand, I also, uh, I, I, I do believe that there are also, uh, that there's also quite a lot of research pointing out that these effects are in fact not that strong for many of these uh, online forums and that they do exist, but that we, um, that then we would have to uh, look more into the sort of the phenomenon of like echo chambers where people who think differently are really um, sort of labeled as enemies and as people who should not be trusted uh, full stop uh, and, and not all uh, sort of selective uh, forms of information and discussion have this, uh, this nature, this character. So I believe we have some reason to be a bit careful uh, when it comes to these concerns about um, sort of a, a, a diversification online being uh, uh, immediately a cause of a lack of a public discourse where people are not even willing to talk to each other anymore. It may, it, it, I mean, it might also be um, uh, that it simply sort of brings to the fore a greater diversification of views and, and perspectives than we uh, than we knew about before or that we encountered ourselves before, or at least this is also an effect of it, I think. Um, and that perhaps, it, and that in that sense, it increases the complexity of public discourse, but that in itself, as is the case with democracy overall, is, is, is perhaps a good thing rather than a bad. It's, it's, just, uh, it's just difficult to then indeed find the right way to um, have all the, these interactions in such a way that they can be 
uh, productive that we can actually learn from each other and that they somehow um, uh, yeah, find a reflective way of feeding into um, uh, political uh, decision making. That's, I think, a, a, a clearly a puzzle that we haven't sort of solved yet, and that I haven't solved either. And your mom, I'm sorry, um, uh, but um, uh, yeah, but 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 we should be careful, I think, with claims about this sort of um, diversification being only a problem. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in Panti, in your experience, have you have you seen this? Well, I mean, I wanted to react um, to um, Stefania's uh, and Ava's points about um, the, the the sort of positivity of, of my my first remarks. I mean, I am certainly aware of the fact that um, you one can romanticize the uh, environment before the pandemic. You know, I, I don't think, um, I, I mean, I think the trend towards less interaction was certainly pretty present in a lot of established uh, northern uh, global north democracies and perhaps um, was, was going that way in the global south as well. But certainly in the US and the UK, um, the tribalism, the separation, um, the inability to have those spaces where one meets and talks and interacts um, well, those, those spaces were atrophying, were becoming much smaller. Um, and so my question more is about, as campaigning moves online, what is the, what is the capacity to create those interactive spaces online vis-a-vis -vis the capacity of those interactive spaces in person? Um, because what we do know is that there's a lot of research to show that if you engineer a diverse heterogeneous body, if you engineer um, multicast cricket teams in India, if you engineer uh, women being mayors in Indian villages, um, if you engineer business corporations making decisions based on heterogeneous men and women and, and different ethnic backgrounds um, and ages, all of those things, if you, if you manage to engineer interactions, it produces a lot of normative goods better decisions are made, there's more empathy, there's more tolerance, there's more understanding of the perspective of the other side, and you increase support for basic human rights for the other group, right? It's not perfect, and one can romanticize this, but there's a lot of positives in engineering spaces of interactions. And we were seeing those spaces uh, becoming smaller and smaller before the pandemic, what I worry about is the, um, the capacity in an online world to even engineer those spaces and, and make them vibrant and make them uh, you know, attractive to people to participate in. That's something that Stefania and Ava know more about than I do. But I would say, and, and just one final positive point, is that the online world for some communities is in fact a bit of a godsend, is uh, a place of support, of nurture. If you're a young transgender kid um, and you don't have anybody around you because they're hiding, then your online space is your validation space, is a space that you can feel protected and heard. Um, and so I think as Ava was saying, there are some potential elements to online organizing that are good. It's just, it's hard for me to understand how we engineer the interactive spaces that produce that empathy, that understanding, uh, and, and the things that I'm interested in, which is sort of reassuring basic equal rights for every group, wherever they come from. Thanks, Andy. Stefania, okay, how do we engineer these spaces? Can you tell us? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm not an engineer, but no. I spend a lot of time thinking, or let's say looking at online communities. Mm. Uh, but I'm also one of those that tend to highlight uh, the, the reasons why we should worry more than, you know, looking at positive examples of the ones that um, Andrew was uh, talking about and Eva as well. So what I can say is that with the move uh, to the online, which is, has been indeed accelerated by the pandemic in an inability of, you know, hosting rallies and, and large gatherings, uh, what uh, we, uh, we, we get in return is uh, an increased homophily. I mean, uh, I've already mentioned, for example, filter uh, bubbles, but also an increased competition for attention. So mm -hmm. for eyeballs, right? 
for our um, you know, uh, time essentially and willingness to spend time engaging and sharing and reposting and repurposing only certain content instead of others. Now it is true that um, you know, the, the fact that you go digital might mean that also groups that are less resourced than others or less, for example, established political parties, like in the Netherlands, um, uh, that is the case of Volt, for example. So a new pan-European uh, party. So parties who don't have actually a party structure behind them, and in this case, even like you know, a, a party that is deliberately supranational, if you want, and is running for national election, therefore it lacks the you know the historical, uh, socio uh, social, cultural legacy that others have. So, so those parties, those new actors, uh, can gain visibility. But then again, it comes down to um, uh, availability of resources. So what uh, we see is that uh, par parties pay for ads. Parties pay for ads and target ads on the basis of data uh, sets of uh, voters that have already uh, collected over time. And parties especially employ marketing agency to do that. So again, you're back at square one, right? If you are uh, an established party, it's more likely that you have all of these uh, resources already uh, in place. So I would just like to spend a couple of, like 35 seconds uh, saying that we are indeed looking at the Dutch election. It's a group of us from media studies, so from the humanities, but also from the social science faculty uh, here at the University of Amsterdam. So it's media studies and uh, um, a group from uh, ASCOR, the Amsterdam School of Political Communication. And we are, are trying to use digital methods, if you want, so scraping um, Facebook to look for political ads and, uh, you know, together with the possibilities of um, opinion, uh, public opinion research. It's a bit too early now to, to actually say what we're finding because, uh, you know, we just started data collection uh, like 20, 20 days ago, I believe. No, a bit more actually, but yeah, it, we are still, you know, gathering the data. So maybe in a month, in two months from now, I'm able to give you more insights about this, this idea of polarization and the question of uh, diversity. For the moment, I can anticipate that we see established parties spending much more than others, therefore sending out many more ads. So I'm sorry, I'm not able to, you know, um, tell anything, share anything about uh, any valuable insights about engineering, better spaces. What I can tell you uh, from having worked with, uh, you know, the interception, intersection of social movements and technology and looking at autonomous infrastructure for a long time is that um, I'm not super fond of the idea of engineering in the sense that it has to come from a bottom up uh, tension or need rather than, you know, uh, as experts, assuming we are experts, uh, able to, you know, with all our information about whatever field we are good at, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult still to create something that people decide to hang out in. So that's another uh, side uh, note. But yeah, definitely it's, it's a very interesting proposition to try to engineer or to favor uh, interaction. I mean, it's also what uh, Facebook in itself, just looking at Facebook, but the same can be said about other platforms, is trying to, to do, you know, correcting algorithms as we speak uh, to increase, I mean, to intercept those tensions that, uh, you know, and they've and they already exposed, you know, they need to, to have more diverse voices. Uh, they need to have certain type of interaction and interaction that respect also and promote human rights. And I think one uh, one claim about political micro targeting, because that's a topic I also do research on at the moment, is or is that it might, in fact, uh, uh, better the position of small parties, right? So in that sense, your finding or the one that you're sort of speculating about now would actually counter that idea, right? That that smaller parties are favored by this practice of. Uh, of, of micro targets. Online. Would you agree, Stefania? Yeah, sorry, I just missed. So there has been a, a drop in the connection here. So I had to say I only grasp part of what uh, you said, Eva. Yeah, sorry, I'll quickly repeat. Now, I also do work on political micro targeting, and I know that one claim about it, about one possible. Uh, promise of political micro-targeting is that it favors smaller parties um, uh, and that it sort of levels the playing field, but then your the finding that you just tentatively spoke about um, might counter that promise, right? 
Yeah, exactly. If we just look at the data for the Netherlands as we speak now, and I mean, as I said, we are collecting data, so it's a bit, it's very premature to speak uh, about this data. <clears throat> Uh, but um, yeah, we actually see uh, something different. We see smaller parties actually at the beginning were completely absent in this race for uh, political ads, uh, which, you know, again, speaks probably to resources or simply to a different uh, way of advertising in the same moment in which we noticed that, for example, sorry to, to use the same example again, but Vault was not represented in the, in the um, micro-targeting um, data. I got a flyer, a very old style flyer in my post box, which, uh, you know, is somewhat surprising if you think that this is, you know, the sort of up and coming young party, right? So we are, we stand here to be, um, uh, how do you say, um, uh, to be proven wrong in a way, you know? But um, definitely what I would like to say is that uh, also to connect to what Andrew said about the have and the have not, what uh, we actually see is that, uh, the system, you know, the, the ecosystem of political advertising, of uh, political debate might change around us, but certainly who is favored in this game is whoever has the literacy to understand, you know, the, the complex ecosystem. So understand, for example, what personalization algorithms are and what they do to you, and simply know that you might be missing out something, and you might be exposed to more and more of the same, and to you know, more fully uh, communities as opposed to seeing other people, uh, ideas. Um, so that that again just simply adds an, an extra level of, of concern. But yeah, there's um, it's interesting when you look at political micro type of dating. Um, data are an issue in the sense that often we speak based on data that companies themselves make available, which is you know that questionable, <laughs> but also. Uh, there is very, very contradictory findings. It's very difficult to actually, you know, put your hands on um, conclusive data sets, if there is such a thing in science anyway. Yes, the project that, that I'm involved in also has, a, has, has produced a, uh, a dashboard showing the, the targeted uh, ads that, that are, uh, are placed now in the ad libraries of the different platforms that make, these, uh, make this data available at uh, politica dash and um, uh, uh, and uh, but it also uh, that that also uh, has uh, some blogs about indeed what is transparent about these uh, ad libraries and what isn't and what kind of data can actually be derived from them and what can't and i think there are still severe limits to uh, to their let's say um, to their transparency and so therefore to our ability to to in fact monitor um, uh, how much targeting happens on the basis of what that happens. Um, uh, yeah, how, how their policies are, are indeed um, uh, operationalized, etc. So um, um, yeah, so it's interesting to look at those. And but uh, yeah, I agree with Stefania that's a, that it's, in that sense, it's a difficult um, subject to, um, to to grasp uh, and to be to, to, to know exactly what what happens there, because you have to rely in part on uh, on what platforms do. Yeah. Just to before we, we, we move on, I would like to, you know, big shout out and thank you to actually ACES for um, contributing to actually sponsor the project that I'm talking about, which is a collaboration not only with ASCOR, between ASCOR and Media Studies, but also with the False Grant and with a panel survey company called INO Research in the Netherlands. I think these things, you know, when we talk about experimental uh, approaches and attempts to make sense of uh, this very complex uh, ecosystem and dynamics in an independent manner involving users, therefore also trying to just not rely on company data, but also to educate users at the same time, offering you know, food for thought and you know, engagement experience that might make them think about uh, risks and benefits then it's really fundamental to be able to think interdisciplinary, but also that you know, some visionary people decide to put a little bit of money in your uh, crazy idea. Otherwise, we will still be talking uh, you know, out of wishful thinking. Sorry, just a small interjection. No, but thank you. I mean, you know, it's you should tap in the URLs of the projects into the chat so that everybody can go off and and validate your research afterwards. Um, but it's, I mean, it's it's it is really interesting to think about how this data is used by these platforms to link up to the political parties and see how this then turns into, you know, micro-targeted campaigns and whatnot. I'm wondering. 
what kind of um, campaigning I will be subjected to since I told Albert Heim that I'm 99 years old and have 15 children um, when I signed up for the, the bonus card. You know, <laughs> so, uh, and I'm not on Facebook. So um, these, these kinds of questions, you know, to me, move us into the next round, um, which is about uh, electioneering, actually. Um, and maybe since we've already started to cover some of the topics here, um, I'd like to pick up on something that you were saying, I think all three of you were saying, about um, about the strategic nature of the, 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 the campaigning, right? So on one hand, this is becoming a very, uh, yeah, a marketing strategic issue, right? And the other thing that we were talking about before in the previous round about issues of deliberation and so on, they seem to be kind of slipping through the cracks or slipping through the big hole. Right? And I was just wondering, <clears throat> you know, how, how can we, if we think about how elections and how campaigning is actually going or the direction that it's taking right now, you know, looking at this data and so on, how can we actually bring these two, or how can we reconcile this to have a, a, a more normative, a more appropriate view of what democracy needs to be for um, the 21st or yeah, the 21st century? Eva, yeah. do you want to go first? I yeah, think I think, <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, because this, uh, this is indeed a, a central, um, uh, has been a central question in my research and, um, and I, uh, it's on the one hand, um, it's it's true, right? And and this is also a topic of I think great concern both in sort of public debates about campaigns and also in academic research uh, into these techniques that uh, campaigns are to a great extent strategic uh, affairs, where um, strategic questions about how to most efficiently uh, use one's uh, one's tools, right, to to uh, persuade uh, as many uh, as many voters as one can to increase one's political success. Um, and this uh, may translate into the use of all sorts of uh, persuasive tools that we perhaps would not uh, 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 believe uh, to be good for democracy, particularly from a deliberative point of view, because they perhaps uh, uh, play into emotions or because they indeed use a lot of data to uh, focus exactly on those um, characteristics that we have or interests that we have um, that um, uh, and, and use those uh, to to get our attention and perhaps also to persuade us of certain political positions um, and we uh, I think we have reasons to be uh, to be vigilant about these techniques and to be to be critical on the other hand and this is the question you raised um, I also think that um, uh, even if you take a deliberative point of view, which is, has quite sort of high standards when it comes to democratic procedures and to the importance of uh, of ex exchanging information, of critical debate, of using arguments in politics, uh, like I said at the beginning, uh, also based on values, still I believe that um, campaigning in such a way is not necessarily or inherently um, at odds with these ideas. Um, as long as, of course, um, certain sort of boundaries aren't crossed. But I do think that um, uh, the fact that campaigns uh, sort of uh, do much of the democratic heavy lifting by trying to reach as many people as they can with the tools that they have, uh, indeed also given the fact that our political resources in terms of time and attention are, are scarce, right? Um, uh, is that in fact useful for, uh, for democracy? Um, um, even deliberative democracy, and um, uh, uh, and and this is this is so because we still need uh, need our attention to be grabbed by politics. We need to be engaged in politics, and uh, campaigns do try to do this. And I do think we should not lose sight of the fact that in the end we can still understand campaigns, uh, or we should want to understand campaigns at least as as persuasive efforts. Um, uh, of course, they still need to adhere to some of to these um, deliberative principles, but that doesn't exclude a strategy in terms of using your, your resources uh, as efficiently as possible, for instance, or indeed 
uh, working hard to get the attention of voters, for instance, with perhaps other instruments than only arguments and information, right? I mean, we need other tools in democratic discourse as well. So the two aren't at odds with each other. And I think that's true. That's a very general point to make here. Uh, but for online campaigning, for instance, sort of returning to the to the theme of the pandemic and this year, that's true as well. Uh, for instance, if you look at political micro-targeting that we already uh, talked a bit about, um, on the one hand, hand, you might be concerned about the use of data as a basis for persuasion of very specific groups using very specific messages. On the other hand, um, this could also be a way of simply addressing those that are interested in certain issues about those particular issues, right? Mm -hmm. um, or indeed addressing minorities um, uh, about issues that otherwise in a, in a campaign that relies more on broadcasting, uh, choosing one uh, message for an entire campaign, right? Uh, wouldn't even address. So it, it also adds, I think, um, things to a campaign that that in fact enrich uh, or have the uh, ability at least to, to enrich uh, the deliberative nature of campaigning. Um, and again, uh, there are a lot of uh, criteria or conditions that you may have um, that limit, uh, limit these possibilities, but, but that does, that's not to say that, that it's not there. And I think sometimes in our concerns about these techniques, we tend to overlook that they also have these, uh, these promises uh, and that campaigning is in the end has still the goal of persuading of, uh, citizens of political ideas, uh, and that and this is a, a communicative effort, not a strategic effort to use the uh, Habermasian uh, distinction. So, um, uh, so yes, strategy is a reason for concern, and we should um, uh, we should be critical, but. Um, um, uh, but not become, uh, I think, skeptical uh, about campaigning as such. Colleagues, Andy, Stefania, um, I'm sensing this, um, this um, uh, is it optimistic caution or cautious optimism? Cautious optimism, I think, is what you have, Eva. Um, uh, and well, let me, let me say, I mean, because I'm um, not in Europe, I'm based in the United States, um, you know, my perspective is a little bit skewed in the sense that um, I'm thinking about what I know about Dutch democracy. Um, and from the outside, and I know this may not be the perception from the inside, from the outside, it looks like a relatively healthy patient that needs to improve. And, um, you know, obviously there are some issues that could be done much better. Uh, and there are challenges to the vibrancy of democracy. Um, but the institutions work relatively well, the access to the vote is relatively equal, the capacity to participate in politics is pretty high comparatively. And I'm sitting in a place where the patient is not relatively healthy, it's on life support, you know. So, you know, if you're a doctor and you're saying, well, this patient here, access to the vote is entirely unequal deliberate malfeasance in politics is the name of the game. The institutions are um, riven with a poisonous cancer um, across the board. Um, and um, so the questions about vibrancy of democracy in America um, and around the pandemic uh, seem to be so pressing and so crucial and so visceral to people because the rules of the game seem to have entirely fallen apart. And the legacy and the consequences of that are really uh, bad and negative to, uh, to, to, to people who are not the haves within society, the have nots. So when I think about the, the, the Dutch experience, you know, part of, part of the difficulty um, for me to offer useful sort of commentary is that, you know, I, I would be suggesting most of the Dutch political institutions for America to improve America you know, bring in um, access points to politics like the Dutch system, bring in an election system that isn't solely based on money um, and geographical um, manipulations, um, bring in a type of, um, you know, multi-party system that is relatively stable. So, so the interesting thing from my perspective is um, the elections coming up seem to, um, 
Well, uh, even looking at opinion polling for parties, the parties don't seem to be changing dramatically, right? I mean, the popularity of parties across the board varies, but there's not a sea change in the sort of tribal identity to the half dozen plus parties that you have. Whereas in the United States, a little change in vote share dramatically upends the system, right? Millions of people vote, the presidency is won or lost on a few thousand votes here and there in various states. And those votes can be easily manipulated, moved, um, and the whole system is rigged in dramatic ways. Um, so I'm not sure where I'm going with that, but just saying that, you know, uh, from this side of the pond, it looks like the institutions of um, the low countries should be just transported over here. And that's even without Belgium having a government for most of the last three years. <laughs> It's still better than the United States. Yeah, it's not like we can look to the UK uh, either. But <laughs> Eva. Yeah, yeah. Can I just briefly respond? Uh, because I completely understand your concerns. I think uh, for me, as uh, as a well democratic scholar, let's say, um, uh, one concern is that our debates about, let's say, the principle of. Um, certain democratic um, institutions, ideas, uh, uh, practices like political micro-targeting sometimes can become very infused with the American context. Mm -hmm. um, that is very familiar, I think, to all of us and, uh, and, and also, of course, very present in the work of American scholars about these topics. And, um, and so I think it's important to step back from these differences in democratic uh, systems, even though they matter greatly, I completely agree with you, uh, for yeah, how institutions operate, how these practices work, it's, and what effects they have on democracy, the quality uh, of deliberation, etc. Um, to, to, yeah, to investigate, which is sort of the point I was making, is, are these connections necessary? Or, uh, or, or do, uh, yeah, or, or is it at least in principle possible indeed that campaigns for instance are both strategic and um, communicative persuade on the base of arguments etc so um yeah i mean I, I just building on that i guess i guess a bit um there are several books on my shelf here that were written 20 years ago. Um, <clears throat> now they're all on a, on PDF, but uh, were written 20 years ago that talked about the optimism of, of the internet and so on, and really looked at this in a way that was actually transforming politics and transforming democracy for the better. And now it seems as we start to see how this actually plays out, we still have, well, some of us are still cautiously optimistic and some are, um, tending towards the more cynical um, spectrum of things. And it, it's, uh, you know, I, I guess we've heard from you as to where you would position yourselves in that, uh, on that spectrum. Um, but I mean, it's, it's really interesting to me to see how these kinds of debates are, are, are still going, right? And how we're still looking at how, how um, as, you know, we see different actors using data or using the internet in different ways. We see how this is emerging. Um, um, so we talked about this idea. Ah, yeah, you talked about the idea of broadcasting um, as opposed to micro-targeting, right? So the kind of the old-fashioned way, I guess, of broadcasting or putting um, um, brochures in your letterbox. Uh, which can still be an important part of campaigning, by the way. I mean, the, the be... media, broadcasting media are still important. It's, uh, we sometimes forget that when we study uh, online campaigning, and uh, but it's still very influential, I think. Yeah, that's that, that was, yeah, I was going to say, there's not, it's not a replacement, is it? It's kind of like a, a, a dual system now that we see. And um, one of the things that kind of came up to me was that, you know, you also mentioned this idea of emotion. Um, and how that plays into to, to, to politics and campaigning now. Is that becoming something that, you know, that you see, I mean, I tend to see that, or at least in my very high level view, I tend to see that quite often in, in political campaigning now, that it's much more driven by emotion on the one hand. Is that something that you see more, that, that, that we're looking for reactions um, well, again, yeah, I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but but claims about what happens more now than in the past are yeah. empirical claims, and I can't really, I have to be very careful there. Um, I must say that um, 
I mean, the use of emotions in campaigns was a great theme in the uh, noughties and I think also very much before that. So I don't think in that sense that I don't have the impression that that's new in any way, really, uh, or or that it would be more so now than in the past. I actually I'm, I'm not necessarily convinced that that's the case. But again, I uh, <laughs> have to be careful there. Um, but I think. Uh, all sorts of there are of course all sorts of uh, sort of persuasive um, instruments like uh, like uh, the use of emotions, but also um, um, nudges or uh, or techniques like um, uh, like priming, where where you um, make sure that the sort of the, the the discourse is about certain issues and not others, and that we that focuses our attention on these issues as a as a, as a way of deciding. Um, and, and of course, all these techniques are, uh, uh, to an extent, uh, uh, seem to counter the, the central idea of argumentation, right? That we, that we decide or, or come to our views on the basis of, of uh, rational argumentation. But on the other hand, I think if you look at politics, then um, I think then, then uh, Let's say emotional engagement is a, is also a central part of what politics is all about, right? Where that we the fact that we care about certain uh, about certain topics, about certain issues, uh, the fact that we are uh, scared of climate change, for instance, or angry about uh, about bad politics. Uh, Andy also gave a, gave a few great examples a moment ago. Oh, these things, these emotions have a have a rightful place, I think, in in politics. And so, in that sense. I don't think that you should um, uh, that you should want to eliminate uh, emotions also from from political communication at all. It's just um, are these emotions justified by the facts? Do they are they used in such a way that they sort of uh, take up all the space? Right, that we don't have room for sort of the next step of evaluating those emotions or um, uh, yeah, or, or perhaps stepping away from them or, um, uh, yeah, or, or deciding on the right course of action. So I think those are the kinds of questions that we need to ask, but not necessarily focusing solely on, uh, on, on the use of, uh, uh, on the use of these techniques alone. Um, but, but concerns about this are, I think, if you're asking about changes over time, I think concerns about sort of the manipulativeness of political communication are in fact very, old and sort of always come up again with sort of the same urgency uh, when some, yeah, when perhaps some new technique has been discovered or rediscovered. Um, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. There's much more to say about that, but uh, let me stop here. Thanks, Eva. Uh, uh, thank you, Eva, for making our job much easier for excellent <laughs> overview. I'd just like to add an extra layer of concern, or if you want to try to, to reflect a bit on Jamal's input on, uh, the difference between now and then. And I think another important dimension to look at is how do we enjoy or you know, get served any of this message, whether it is you know, persuasive or strategic or more or communicative uh, nature. And so what you see is that a lot of, and, it, and this is in fact accelerated by the pandemic, we tend to now live or uh, you know, absorb a lot of this at the individual level with far less occasions for you know, the collective exchange and the collective dimension of um, political uh, opinion formation, which uh, you know you can see, for example, a play very concretely. Also, in terms, of, if you look at emotions, at a campaign uh, rally, for example. I mean, like the the U.S. is a great example in that sense. We have far less of that uh, you know spectacular engagement uh, in the Netherlands and other places in Europe. But um, yeah, I mean, what, what the pandemic has probably accelerated is this uh, individualization of uh, the experience. And that's something probably to, to worry about. Yes, and uh, could I just add that, of course, I mean, uh, one idea in, uh, about the liberation is, of course, that it is a very day-to-day -day activity. And so you can think about rallies, but you can also simply think of uh, conversations with friends, uh, meetings in cafes, etc., and that kind of deliberation, of course, has been very much impoverished by these uh, lockdown conditions. Uh, so, uh, and 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 the pandemic. So, yeah, I think, and that certainly, and indeed, is an occasion to work through perhaps uh, perspectives or, or emotions or um, uh, new ideas. Um, yeah, so that's certainly a concern. One 
I would expect to be temporary, but still we have elections now and they matter for four years at least. So, yeah. Andy, do you want to, to come in on this on this topic? No, I'll, I'll uh, wait for other questions and come in on the next one. Okay, because uh, there was just one thing that I, I, I wanted to, uh, this issue of individualization versus collectivization in a sense. This is, you know, this is, um, I guess, I, I'm not going to talk about trends because we can't measure anything yet. But I mean, I see this, this idea coming through, you know, look in your studies of micro-targeting, you're looking at how individuals can be, can be um, targeted in a sense, right? Um, and I was just wondering, is this, could you think about this, not can you measure this, can you think about this in ways of um, the personalization of politics, but moving towards a more kind of egotistical politics? Uh, does this bring anything towards as understanding the collective nature. And I, what I'm trying to do there is bring in these questions of different groups and how we see different groups and how we represent different groups or minority groups or different voices um, in, in our society. If, if political messaging is on the one hand becoming much more targeted to an individual, does that mean that we think less of the group or, or how does that work? Um, is that something you can, or is that too vague a question to answer? Well, get? if I can just if I can just say something briefly in theory or in principle, it w shouldn't have to, one doesn't imply the other, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, concern, very specific concerns can still be uh, moral concerns, can be other regarding concerns. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and coming back to sort of the, the, the earlier discussion about the role of minorities in, in campaigns, um, their concerns, for instance, are of course questions about justice. They're not just egotistical or, you know, something like that. So, um, so minority concerns, for instance, or minority interests um, are at the same time uh, claims about justice that, can, that, that are um, uh, uh, that might not have a place in a, in a in a campaign where you do not have this effect of uh, of sending very specific messages to specific people. So in theory, it, it's uh, not necessarily the case, but perhaps Stefania can say a bit more uh, about that in practice. I'm not sure I actually can on the basis of any empirics. And I'm, I mean, your, your question, Jamal, made me think a little bit about also, for example, what is the coverage, so the media coverage, the storytelling about uh, the pandemic, which has uh, been extremely polarized from the very beginning. It was always a matter of us and them before it was us, the Chinese infected, and us, the rest of the world were still, you know, doing well. Then it became, you know, for example, I'm Italian, and I suffered a little bit from that, right? Because it was in Italy when it all exploded, skiing, so completely unrelated, like very safe and everything, or, well, luckily safe for me at least. And then, uh, you know, I came back to the Netherlands, and then it became the Netherlands versus Italy, that was the new China for the pandemic. And then you're like, it went all this way, right? And so in a way it is, it was um, a sort of, uh, you know, in, in the general um, fear, let's say of, uh, you know, some a phenomenon which was uh, and is to some extent still relatively unknown from the scientific uh, point uh, of view at least, but also from the very popular right point of view. The, the coverage was extremely polarized, but also at the end of the day, and this is, might sound like a contradiction, but this is actually what, work, uh, what happened in practice. At the same time, also very much concerned about us, mm. right? So in a way, polarized as in trying to, to establish that in a way or another, me, my in-group, my family, my country, whatever is safe or safer, and not to blame, while at the same time also losing completely the ability to look and care for others that were infected, let's say, or in, in a worse situation. So um, I don't know, this doesn't really say much about the personalization of, um, of politics and minority concerns, but if anything, media coverage of the pandemic has not really um, done a good job into bringing uh, minorities into uh, the picture. And by minority, really, I literally mean just the different or the distant, right? Sorry, it's, it's more like a very, you know, um, 
experience based on personal perspective rather than actual uh, empirics. But I don't know whether it resonates with Eva and Andrea or of Lushama. No, I do recognize it. I was also thinking of the coverage of uh, the groups that, that sort of come first for the vaccination, right? That's also very much a, um, a, a, a competitive frame that's, that's, that seems to be used in, uh, in, in, in thinking about that, yes. No, I, I, I share the observation at least, yeah. It's quite funny. My 12-year-old my son had um, maybe the opposite reflection. He, we were going past the supermarket and there was a big sign from the local authority that said, together we can beat the virus. And my, my son said, no, we can't be, we have to be apart. We have to be socially distant. So <laughs> as you say, it, it doesn't work. We can't do it together. We have to do it apart. But anyway, um, yeah. Andy, what's, what's been the experience in the US on that front then? Has there, has, um, there's been a lot of us and themming, using and themming, right? Has there been uh, discussions about collectiveness, collectivity, in terms of responding? yeah? I mean, I, I think there's a there's a balance. Uh, on one side, you do have a lot of us and them. You have you know anti-vaxxers versus vaxxers. You have um, anti-maskers versus maskers, and that's very partisan. It's very politically overlapping, right, between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, unfortunately, you also have some um, targeted racism, anti-Asian American, you know, attitudes, experience, um, this sort of buzz that uh, it's the China virus, as President Trump had, you know, tagged it. And so there have been incidents of um, uh, attacks upon uh, Asian Americans because of that as well. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, the reality is that there has been a lot of collectivization of goodwill, of support, of communities coming together. Um, you, you notice um, there, there is some degree of empathy uh, crossover as well, in that I think that some, some, um, some, some people who are living through the pandemic are now seeing connections to other health and um, to commun communal conditions that, that, that target specific groups. So the African-American community or Latinx communities or poorer communities in America, their experience of corona, uh, COVID, um, actually has, uh, I think, heightened to um, other wealthier white Americans, the reality of day-to-day -day experiences with health conditions in those marginalized communities. So on, on one side, there's been more polarization and there's a more sort of atomization of, of views and tribalization politically. But on the other side, there has been a degree of communal support, empathy um, driven. I mean, the, the interesting thing about um, uh, support for, say, politicians or the disability community in America is that it's very high amongst African-Americans. Um, African-Americans are more disposed to support candidates with disabilities or health conditions um, than other ethnic groups in America. And it's because they've lived through decades and decades, if not centuries, of being more put upon by those conditions. Um, and there's also, even though one of the interesting findings um, that, you know, is partly related to this is that um, the likelihood of being hearing impaired or deaf is in completely not um, uh, genetically linked to race at all, right? In fact, African Americans are slightly less likely to be hearing impaired or deaf than white Americans actually considerably less likely. But the support for hearing impaired deaf people amongst African Americans is three times what it is for white Americans. So even though that condition doesn't affect you as a community, you actually are, uh, you have higher le levels of empathy politically, socially, because of your experiences of related conditions. And I think the, uh, the epidemic is, is breeding some, some empathy in those respects. Optimism. That's good. <laughs> well, yes, if something comes out of this pandemic, then let's hope it's empathy. Um, we have, um, a, a, I have a question. I have received a question from Hido, um, who's put it in the chat, because apparently the Q&A uh, isn't working. 
I don't know if anybody else can um, uh, submit. Ah, yes, you can submit questions in the Q&A box if you want. But we have one from Hido, which I'll read out to you in my best English. Um, here it is. Andy seemed rather optimistic about the possibility to engineer shared and diverse spaces, whereas Stefania seemed not so. Can you both elaborate on this? At the same time, big platforms like Facebook and Twitter have started to interfere in some cases where populist politicians were spreading lies, an understandable move, but this will also chase, for instance, right-wing communities into their own sub-platforms, parlor, uh, leading to more fragmentation. How do you, um, how would you respond to, first of all, the question and then the, the, the comment? I put them together, sorry, but you, you understand the gist. Um, who would like to go first? Andy and Stefania? Yeah, no, I can, I can double down on my optimism. I didn't know I was going to turn out to be the Pollyanna of the, 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 the chat show today, but that's fine. Um, but um, no, I mean, I just think that my experience in post-conflict societies, my experience in reading literature about um, breeding accommodation in inter-ethnic um, and also LGBTQ and straight contexts as well, shows that, um, and you know, my experience as a graduate student in Cape Town during the transition from apartheid, um, shows that, you know, if you can create a space which isn't necessarily a political space, but it's a space where you play together or you sing together or you do, um, you go to school together, right? If you create intercommunal spaces, you do generate a higher degree of trust, of empathy, and uh, lower degrees of, of hostility when there are flashpoints. And I mean, there's a fabulous book from 20 years ago by, uh, by a, a scholar called Ashu Varshney. And Ashu Varshney, just to um, summarize, looked at towns in India that were equal proportions of Hindus and Muslims but some of those towns were geographically segregated. The Hindus and Muslims didn't play together. They didn't live together. They didn't go to school together. They didn't do stuff together. And in other towns, there was a much higher degree of integration for whatever accident of history that they did play. They played sports. They, they did stuff together. And when there were flashpoints, when there was a, a trigger, the towns that had historically been segregated exploded into massive violence and death. And the towns that had histories of integration and spaces for communication had much, much lower levels of violence um, with similar triggers. Um, and this is from the sort of 70s, 80s and 90s in, in India. And I just think that um, if you look at um, spaces that are engineered to breed um, some degree of familiarity with the other side, um, this is the place where fences do not make good neighbors. Fences make bad neighbors. Um, and if you have at every level some degree of interaction between the Hindu, the Muslim, the Christian, um, the, the Somali, the white European, um, the straight and the gay, all those things. And the, the, the final example I'd give is that the number of people who support gay rights in America tracks almost exactly the number of people who say they have a family or close friend who is lesbian or gay or bisexual, right? The number of people who support transgender rights almost exactly mirrors the number of people who say they know somebody who's transgender. And people don't know anybody who's transgender because the community is smaller and those transgender people have hidden themselves for good reason. So about 22, 23% of Americans say they know somebody who is transgender and that's the level of support for their rights. 90, 95% of Americans say they know somebody who is LGB and that's the number of people who support those rights. So I know it's simplistic, but I think there is purchase in creating spaces for somebody, it's not a panacea, but it creates a better relationship between the inside and outside. Thank you. I think the, the core question is whether the pandemic um, allows us to move, to allows us to rethink this and maybe post pandemic, think about creating these spaces more actively or proactively, or whether the pandemic actually makes the distance even wider between these groups so that the interaction and the empathy doesn't emerge. 
Stefania, maybe uh, you want to react? Yeah, just to, to complement what Andrew uh, said and the beautiful examples that he offered, I guess my question is, well, first of all, I, it's not that I do not have a trust into the possibility of having or engineering uh, better spaces. But my question is, who should do the engineering if you want? And uh, should it come from uh, you know, the top down or the bottom up? Just to summarize the big tension that exists uh, there. And uh, I spent a lot of time in uh, the good old days studying, but also doing um, alternative community medias as they were uh, called in those days. We're talking about the 90s and the early uh, 2000s. So ages ago compared to the infrastructure the digital infrastructure of uh, today. And what we would see there is a lot of this attempts by communities themselves to create their own space for deliberation in this case and participation and uh, you know, display and enactment of identity and you name it, really beautiful experiences. I'm thinking, you know, uh, Andrew spoke about uh, India, I was thinking about, for example, um, in certain areas of uh, Colombia ridden by, uh, let's say, political violence, although it was a bit more complex uh, than that. So how, for example, this space is really forged uh, in a different community and a different, uh, simply nurture the ability of individuals to feel part of uh, the community, therefore also making the liberation uh, better. Now, the problem is that what we have today is that uh, there is, um, I mean, the resources that are needed to create these spaces are very, very different from what they were back then. I mean, I'm thinking only, uh, so when we think about engineering spaces, I'm thinking about digital infrastructure. There's a lot out there that is not a digital infrastructure, which is not an alternative to Facebook, if you want. But pardon, I mean, I come from studying those things. So that's my, if you want, my contribution. And it is extremely difficult to create an alternative where the critical mass is that works uh, following different uh, principles. There has been examples. And actually, as I was listening to Andrea, I was typing furiously, trying to figure out there's one that I have in mind, but I'm not even sure that's that one. Um, so, but also it, it's uh, because I'm saying something negative, it's probably not good to, to mention it anyway. But what I want to say is that there has been a number also, you know, from Silicon Valley itself, attempts at creating a different, better space, but that um, have had far less power of attraction than other less optimal spaces from the deliberation of democracy, democratic point of view have. So that's, um, you know, um, my, my, if you want negative, I'm sorry about that, <laughs> but perspective on, uh, you know, one specific way of engineering community, which goes through the digital infrastructure, the data infrastructure, if you want, because the two are very much now uh, linked. But yeah, I mean, like, uh, if anything, the, the pandemic does, uh, has made explicitly the fact that we want to hang out and we miss each other. And we probably need, uh, you know, more optimistic messages to go by, <laughs> and also probably different ways of being together. So, who knows? You know, I just want to close on a, on a, on a positive note. I don't have any evidence for that, but uh, except a very strong desire for a better world. Okay, we we still have um, a few minutes. I can still still at least six minutes of your time, if that's okay. So if there are any questions from the um, audience, um, the q and I believe is functioning. And so you can type your question in there or you can, um, you might even be able to raise your hand. It depends on what status you have. But it, whilst we're waiting, maybe I'll just go um, and follow up a bit with what Hido was saying about Facebook and pushing uh, right-wing communities into their own sub-platforms. Sorry, you wanted to uh, you wanted to end optimistically, and uh, we'll try and find a way to do this, um, Stefania. But um, what I uh, that was something that, that in in Hido's comment he was kind of saying, you know, as these big communities, so Facebook and, and, and the others, they uh, start to impose rules, they start to engineer the spaces in, in different ways, right, that, uh, that appeal to politicians and political actors. Um, what happens, do these alternative movements, do they, do they go somewhere else? Do they create big bubbles of their own with very thick skins? And then there's echo chambers that you mentioned before. 
and you've heard that they become thicker and thicker and do they uh, bigger and bigger and um, are we getting then to a, um, a situation where communication and deliberation becomes very difficult? Um, I know maybe no evidence yet, but lots of reflection, I think, lots of opportunity for reflection there. I think that's one um, very uh, reasonable concern. Um, I, I think it also, these, these decisions that these platforms have made um, also highlight uh, the fact that, and of course we were aware of this, but still they, they again sort of highlight the fact that how important they are as, let's say, regulators of forums that, that simply play a large role now in, um, uh, well, in, in public discourse, and that's partly because of the discourse that happens on there, but also uh, how it is sort of then uh, written about by uh, by journalists, for instance. So um, it well, it feeds into public discourse in all sorts of ways, and um, yeah, it, it highlights the problem that that these are indeed still corporations with their own uh, aims, and this, in a way, of course, is a response to you might say public. Uh, democratic demands about how these uh, platforms function on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, uh, yeah, th their level of accountability and, and transparency uh, are still um, uh, also, I think, uh, concerns that are that 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 come with these moves, right? So, indeed, the, the, um, a decision by Twitter to ban uh, political advertising altogether. How do they then? Um, exercise this this policy, right? Do they do they indeed catch everything or not? Can can we can we uh, look at that? Um, uh, is this indeed the right approach, um, or is this response to public pressure? But that we should think about. So, I mean, the content of these decisions, we can debate that. We can debate uh, uh, their role and, uh, uh, and sort of how how as a public we can monitor this. And I think it again points to yeah to the problematic fact that these uh, that, that 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 there's a, a large amount of power in the hands of a few uh, players. But just to, to, to complement what I was said, I totally agree with that. I mean, there's uh, there's also the problem, you know, the, of the of, of uh, there's a legal responsibility in a way of intermediaries that might make them decide in certain direction or favor certain direction. But if we look, for example, at, <clears throat> excuse me, at the strategies of policing social movements historically, it was never to push them into hiding, right? You can police hate speech, for example, thinking about certain extremist forms of uh, political discourse of those that we don't like, by uh, if they are in the open. But in the moment in which you push them into their own space, the risk is that it can escalate dramatically under without the public uh, without the public eye in a way, right? But of course, it's a very difficult decision to make because at the same time as the platform, you don't want to see be seen as um, the, the act or the space giving uh, legs to certain discourses either, right? So you might lose advertisers or funders, funding anyway. So it, it's a very complex um, uh, issue. At the end of the day, what I think matters is that, um, what, what more than matters, what we have to remember is that none of these spaces is actually the public sphere, right? We tend to think about Facebook as uh, you know, a loudspeaker of, of uh, whatever you know, opinion we might have, but this is a private corporation and therefore entitled uh, by the, the rules of the market to set its own rules. And we tend to, to forget that, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a, a really important point. I, I, at least in my mind as well, that that these spaces are private spaces uh, or private run by private companies, and they're not uh, they're not public spaces in that sense. Although the public use them <laughs> and sometimes interpret them in that way. Yeah, ever. exactly. They're also framed in that way, right? By uh, 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 let's say elite discourse, uh, yeah, uh, newspapers, etc. Yeah. 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 So, um, Andy. Pushing, pushing groups onto their own sub platforms. Is that something that you've seen in, 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 in your work? Um... Uh, in the sense of being on online in sub platforms? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, I think to some extent, yeah, but that's, I think just generally whatever the format 
you know, certain groups um, are pushed to the margins, right? So even before an online world, then there were underground groups that, you know, were mobilizing on the margins because that's the space that they had. I mean, again, on the optimistic side, it may be that the online world does give some space, convening space for groups that didn't really have that before. Um, you know, if, you, if you're a very marginalized but geographically scattered community, um, you know, you didn't, weren't able to actually sort of make those contacts with people in the past physically, but now maybe you can have more of a community that politically is mobilized online as well. So, you know, there, it cuts both ways. Um, I, I mean, I, I do think that in all these questions, um, the pandemic is exacerbating previously existing trends and developments in politics. I don't think the pandemic per se is creating brand new things. I think it just exacerbates and minimizes the things that were happening to begin with. I see some nodding heads, but I also see that my clock is ticking and we're one minute over the time. Um, there's calls for optimism, there's calls for alarm, there's uh, calls for more research, there's uh, calls for publication of the research that you're doing and, 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 uh, and um, for the sharing of URLs. I um, invite everybody to go and see the site that uh, Stefania and Agnes, uh, that um, Stefania and Eva, and yes, put it up, Stefania and Eva have, uh, have uh, shared with you in the chat um, so that you can continue the conversation um, on this very, very, uh, well, it's a fundamental topic for, for what's coming next. As Andy said, even when the pandemic is over, I don't think the questions that are being raised by this will be over. And I think that there's, um, there's so much more that we need to do and we can use the pandemic as kind of a case to reflect on the exacerbation, on the exceptionalism of this case. Um, and hopefully um, when we come back, as a group in, <laughs> in real life um, and meet to have this discussion, we can have some more reflections on this point. But anyway, the, it remains for me to say thank you so much to our three speakers. Um, thank you, Stefania. Thank you, Ava. Thank you, Andy. Um, thank you to the audience for being here. And thank you to our organizers, Hido Kertu, and everybody else on the list, Divya, and everybody else on the screen there in front of you. Um, I will now, how do I do this? Do I have to formally close? Do I say, I don't say ora est, I say goodbye, good night. That's it from our side. Thank you.